Hello and welcome to our today's Let's Talk Science session. Uh, today we will address a very interesting and up-to-date topic with the question, how do you use your own data for new business models? So it's all about data-driven business models to increase the performance of customer value creation processes and to monetize the performance of these improvements. Professor Metternich and Mr. Hoffmann will discuss in their presentation various uh, examples uh, to show possible problems and hurdles within the implementation of such data-driven um, business um, models, but also uh, show possibilities how to overcome these. Professor Metternich is head of the Institute of Production Management, Technology and Machine Tools at the University, Technical University of Darmstadt. And Mr. Hoffmann is a member of his staff, Project Management of MIP and CIP. So let's start with the thesis of uh, both speakers. Um, keep your hands off data business models because nearly four fifths of these approaches in industry fail. So we are looking forward how this could, could be changed. I hand over to the two speakers. Thank you. Okay. I hope you can hear me. And uh, I say many thanks for this kind introduction, Dr. Schaefer. And um, my name is Joachim Metternich. This is Felix Hoffmann. He's a research assistant at our institute. And he's an expert in uh, data-driven business models because his research is focusing this topic. OK, and today uh, we want to guide you a bit through this topic and give you a bit our experience, give you a bit back of our experience, which we collected in joint research projects with industry. This broadcast is brought to you from our Learning Factory ZIP. What is a Learning Factory? In this Learning Factory, we train students, educate students, and train practitioners how to become lean, how to digitize a lean production system. Right now, there is a workshop running. So if there is some noise in the background, this is coming from this workshop. But I hope it will not be uh, too noisy. OK, so let me uh, address again our well, our provocative uh, thesis, which is don't do uh, database business models. They make no sense. Why do we say this? Because there are many data uh, available today, from especially from our industry 4.0 efforts. We have many more sensors. We have better connected cyber physical systems that deliver to us data that we can easily acquire. Uh, but we see that most of the database solutions uh, fail. And research says that only 27% of projects that uh, some researchers have looked at have been successful. And we have mostly failures due to difficult to define customer value. So it's difficult for the, for, for the companies that offer those solutions to define what is really a customer value. And so it's difficult to develop a pricing model. And it's difficult to, to give a price to the customer that the customer is willing to pay. Uh, Database business models are too complicated because it's not only in your own uh, competency to offer uh, such a business model. You need interaction with different uh, service providers. For example, uh, artificial intelligence, platform service provider, and so on. And the knowledge build up is necessary and it's expensive, especially for a medium sized enterprise. This is sometimes too expensive. Well, so much about why you should not do this. But what does a database business model consist of? And we see three pillars um, that, that build the foundation for such a business model. And that is first that you need to be clear what is the value proposition that you offer to your customer? What is the additional value that you will create with this service? It's usually it's a service, a database service for your customer. That must be very clear. How will you create in your own organization this value? So how, you, how do you build this value chain? And what is then the revenue mechanism? How do you create cash from this? And of course, in the center of all, who is the customer 
that you are serving and what's the customer need. And uh, of course, you see, this is not an easy task to fulfill. And now I hand over here to my colleague. Yeah, so thank you very much. And as Professor Metternich already stated, there are several reasons why a database business model or a database offering uh, can fail in the market. And now I want to address several paradigm shifts that we found out during our research that have to be addressed in order to successfully um, develop your own database business model. So as you can see here, the first paradigm shift is that you have a change in your strategic mindset. And that is from a goods dominant to a service dominant logic. So as you can see, like in the classical product business that is very widespread nowadays, especially in the machine tool company, you mainly use, if you have data, data as a waste product. It is collected in a big amount, but you just very uh, sporadically really make a use out of the data that you uh, collect. And if you want to be successful in a direction to uh, let data become a part of your business models, you have to take several steps. So it's not directly the Big Bang, but you have to start with data as a tool. So how can data support your own processes in your own company? The second step would be, how can I integrate it really into my strategy in the own company? So you have to use data in order to build own capabilities and unique selling propositions within your own company. And the, the biggest step you can take is really that data becomes the core or the main point of your business model in general. And this is when the business concept is based on the generation processing and especially on the analysis of data in order to bring new value to your customers. And these three steps can only be taken if you really uh, have a look at the product, the process, the service, and also the payment or the revenue models, which are in, uh, in general more digital than usual in a holistic way. Another important thing um, that you have to address, I think that's nothing that is completely new to you, um, is um, the, the fact of customer centricity. So we already have since several years, um, yeah, so to say the, um, the focus on customer centric development of products. But if you look in these old paradigms, what do we really look at is the customer has a technical problem and we offer him a technical solution. So what you need to understand or what we are standing, understanding right now in general at the moment is a technical problem of the customer with the value for the customer that can be really easily calculated because in general you have all the necessary competences in-house in your own company. But with database business models, it's, as I just said, quite more complex because you have to take into account the physical product as well as the service as well as the payment model. So what we look at right now with these new database business models is a process problem that the customer has in general and we offer a combination of a product and a service to address this problem. So you have to have a much more um, deep insight into the customer's um, into the customer's needs, and this addresses the process problems of it. So the customer value uh, in these process problems is generally quite vague, and thus it is pretty hard to get transparency about the customer value and to get customer acceptance as well as a good pricing strategy for this. And also what you have to take into account, these competences are normally not all in-house, but you need to uh, get like uh, a strategic partnership, for example, with different companies in order to be able to address this problem. The third paradigm shift, and I think it really 
is a good connection to the point I addressed before is the, is the topic of customer retention. So if you look into the business models that are going on right now, especially in the machine tool industry, you are like focused on a one-time or spor sporadic exchange of services. So what is mainly in the focus is the point of sale of the machine. So when the machine goes from you to the customer. And afterwards, you only have like sporadic exchange. For example, you do a repair, you sell, you sell a spare part to your customer, and maybe you have like a little bit of a continuous um, contact to him over, for example, like a maintenance contract. For database business models, you really have to rethink the cost and also the very revenue structures that occur because you have a recurring and a continuous exchange of services between you and the customer. So the sale of the machine is only like the nucleus or the starting point for what really is your business. And your business is selling database services to your customer that he can um, consume in different levels, as uh, you can see in the, in the lower illustration of the slide. So what you get is really a stronger relationship with your customer because you integrate them into your own ecosystem and you have a continuous exchange which can also help you to improve your physical products. The last paradigm shift I also uh, think is really, really important if you look at database business model is the change in value creation. This is what you can see here. I think you all know it. Uh, a classic um, yeah, linear value creation with the manufacturer, the OEM in the middle, who has several suppliers who uh, bring several uh, machine parts, for example, into play. And then you have the direct contact of the manufacturer to the customer via the sales or, for example, like the service section. So, your competency, as I just already stated, is largely located into your, in your own company, and it is then a, rip, a different setting feature compared to the um, compared to the um, to compare to the market. In new business models, you have to rethink your value creation in a cooperative way, and this is due to the fact that. Because of this high degree of interdisciplinarity that you have to uh, show within database business models, you really have to go into strategic partnerships with different companies. For example, as you can see in this um, in this slide, uh, with a for example a platform provider for the IoT or for example a data analysis company. So you have a Wide, wide variety of different competencies, especially in data science and um, ICT. And as you all know, um, you might want to build up these um, skills on your own. And I think it's generally a good uh, yeah, strategy in mind. But you also have to um, keep in mind that um, to get those people into your own company, it's pretty hard uh, to get. Uh, this uh, skill of a worker in order to perform uh, these tasks within your own uh, company. So um, this is the paradigm shifts I wanted to address and all these paradigm shifts were already uh, clear to us in the past and uh, we already used these paradigm shifts or the insights on these paradigm shifts to develop new business models um, for uh, especially the machine tool industry or for the production industry in general. And one um, example I have brought to you today is the um, paper stress approach that we developed at PTW, and it is a stress-based payment model for machine tools. And it's like we made our further thoughts on how can you revenue models for machine tools be designed. And what we saw is that in normal leasing models, there is always like an added price that you have to pay because you, the uh, leasee 
always uh, takes into account that you might use a machine over the degree that it was originally sought for. And um, the uh, paper stress approach is a stress-based payment approach. So if you use the machine harder, you pay more. If you use the machine less, you pay less. And um, this is also depicted in the slide. And it really heavily depends on the exchange of data between the customer during the lifetime of the machine and the data analysis through different participants within the business model. And um, this is what we, what we saw is that the starting point might be this new revenue structure, but from exchanging data with your customers, there are several different um, business opportunities uh, that arise. For example, with the data you already have and the data you already um, analyzed, you can also offer him maintenance services, which um, lead to lower downtimes. And this is also a service that you can monetize for yourself and get into a new form of um, like a service-based, data-based service business model for you. And it also showed for us this, that this highly disciplinary approach is um, highly complex to manage and you really have to get into it. But with the right partners and with the right mindset, you can really uh, make progress on this topic and really go forward. And um, with this example, I want to hand over to Professor Metternich again. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, um, well, I, I want to share with you some learning, some amazing learning that uh, Felix Hoffmann and myself made in a joint research project with one of our partners. There is a, a great company producing uh, covers, protective covers for guideways and uh, spindles uh, uh, in, the, in the, um, the, the driving component uh, of a um, machine tool. And they protect those driving components like a, a driving spindle and a guideway. And you see here in this uh, in this picture one of these covers, and those covers over the time uh, they have some wear. And if they have wear, uh, they the protection is not as good as it was, and maybe there is damage then for the machine. And the idea of this uh, manufacture of those covers was, was to gather with us to develop uh, a smart protective cover, a smart protective cover that would um, tell the user how much rest of useful lifetime there is still available from the data that is acquired from the process itself without inspecting the cover. That's the idea. So that is a typical area for data-driven business models. Maintenance, uh, a predictive maintenance maybe. To tell that you have ex to exchange a certain component of a machine tool before it causes a problem before it causes a breakdown. And uh, we gladly started this project with our partner and we developed, uh, we, we checked several sensors, uh, we checked which sensor would give the best data in relation to the measured wear of this protective cover. And we found out that there should be only, that only simple sensors, cheap sensors would make sense uh, and we started with very complicated solutions. Um, in, in the end, it was a force sensor that we, uh, that we applied between the cover and the frame where the cover was attached to get data and to find out if uh, uh, there is a classification into good or bad. So here you see that uh, we were able to classify um, very well this, uh, this um, protective cover into good or bad. Here you see. Um, the result of this work um, and uh, we had one of these uh, covers on a test bench and the cover was moved and moved for back and forward for many many days and um, our trained model of course in the back there is a, a machine learning model that takes the data from the sensor and it is already trained and then it predicts how much lifetime uh, there is still left and uh, one, there is a one which is 100% and zero is nothing left. 
And you see here the, the, the blue dots. This is a typical prediction that is made at a certain point of time. And the orange curve is the mean value from these predictions at this point in time. And you see numbers here. And every number is associated to a certain incident. For example, uh, we could see that one of the, the that the cover was damaged at a certain point. That uh, there was uh, well uh, some change in usage of that cover more intense. And uh, then you can see that the lifetime estimation follows this very well. So for each incident, you see usually that there is a decline in the current condition of this cover. So the model was working, the sensor was working, the technical solution was also working. So now the question is, what will our customer or our partner do with this? And then we found out that there was no business model uh, behind. So our partner didn't have, and that was not part of our work, but we learned a lot from this, he didn't have a business model in mind. So there was, it was not clear from the start how a customer like uh, DMG Mori, for example, would integrate this solution into their machine and how they would use the data from this to maybe uh, build a dashboard from this and how uh, they would then charge the customer in addition for this new service. It was not clear. They didn't have an internal concept for industrialization of that new sensor that we found out to build a new uh, protective and smart uh, protection here uh, which is including this sensor and including the prediction. No revenue model, how to charge their customers. And they were not aware that they had, of course, also to build up knowledge in their own company. It's not a university that will deliver this knowledge over time, because if we hand over the solution to a company, of course, they have to build up their own knowledge and they need to uh, maybe hire new people or they need to uh, build a partnership with another partner who will uh, take over a part of this business. So this was the reason why this project, well, partly, I have to say partly, failed. So there's a huge learning. There was a huge learning from this uh, project yeah. for both of us, mm -hmm. I have to say. So I come more or less to the conclusion of our presentation. And I say, don't implement a database business model if you don't understand the way your customer will integrate a new service and the new product into his own value creation process. If you are not clear how much value you create with your service for the customer, because then you're not able to build a pricing model. And if you cannot make the customer's value transparent to the customer to get acceptance for your new solution, don't do it if you are not willing to acquire the necessary competencies, hire the right people, or get a new partner aboard to cover the aspects of this new business model. And don't do it if you look for a big bang solution. Maybe you do it step by step. Start with a smaller solution and then roll it out. And last but not least, don't do it if you think that your current business model will be valid for the next 20 years. So why should you do it then? Of course, what I'm telling you here is do it, implement, address all these issues and don't think that your current business model will be valid the next 20 years. It will change. It may change tomorrow. It may change in two years, but it will change. And you have a new solution that will create new business for you at hand. If you start uh, not with a big bang, but with a smaller corporation, maybe with an university institute or another. So. Thanks a lot from my side. I hand back. Thank you very to you. much. That's uh, that's a good introduction for the next slide. So if we fetched your interest in this topic, we also have several uh, opportunities to go further into detail. Uh, we have two uh, transfer projects at the PTW, so the Mittelstand Digital Center Darmstadt and Comparty, where we have several uh, offerings just on this topic. So. Uh, a little bit of advertisement at this point, but if you are interested, uh, you can definitely have a look on this. And it's, I think, a good uh, way to go further and to start into this uh, topic of data-based business models in your own company. And this is for free. 
it's there yeah. for you. Please join us. So with this, I can just say thank you very much from our side. Thank you. And uh, we are very happy to hear your questions. And also, if you have questions afterwards, you can contact us over these uh, details. And also, you can have a look in our LinkedIn and our YouTube channel where we also have uh, some content or uh, quite a lot of content right now about database business models. So it's definitely worth it. Especially, yeah. there is a great movie on the paper stress yeah. uh, project, which is uh, in German, but it's very comprehensive. It's yeah. a great movie. Please check yeah. it out. So now we are open for questions. Yeah. <laughs> We're hoping for your questions. Oh, thank you, Professor Metternich and Mr. Hoffman, for your interesting presentation. I think it's a, yeah, it's a topic that companies uh, should really look into because uh, these um, possibilities out of data give new opportunities, as you mentioned, uh, for business value added business models for the customer, of course. Um, so uh, one question is, um, you mentioned the paper stress leasing, um, and you and, and you described that it, um, yeah, th that you pay depending on the uh, quantity of usage, mm -hmm. um, but there must be a minimum cutoff because if he uses, yep. if he does not use it, <laughs> nobody yep. makes money. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's completely right. So there definitely is, uh, so to say, a window for the flexibility you give your customer with this, because uh, I think it wouldn't it would never be economical in a way where you put a half a million euro machine and the customer uses it it's every once in a while for <laughs> for a single component. So there's definitely uh, like limits to this. But um, that's um, definitely a big part of the complexity this model brings. And it also shows very good the uh, high dis interdisciplinarity because we have our expertise, especially from like the general database business model perspective and also from the data analysis perspective uh, regarding machine tools. But what we don't have is like the expertise from the leasing companies and that's what was one of our central partners in this case that we really um, also uh, use this partnership in order to like set these limits um, in order to get to a economically viable uh, path for companies to uh, maybe once then uh, really set this paper stress approach into a um, market position then yeah to make it short, the monthly payment consists of a fixed rate and a variable rate. And this variable rate is the one, of course, that we address. Yeah. Um, is this then, uh, is a different naming, uh, paper stress leasing, is it um, similar uh, to paper part, where you also have a minimum cutoff, uh, because otherwise the machine producers would not be able to finance this? Or you need financial partners. It is. It is neither paper use nor paper part. It is really paper stress. So in this in this project, we developed a, a sensor concept and a a formula concept. So formulas behind the sensor concept uh, and also artificial intelligence would take the data and calculate the uh, amount of the rest of useful lifetime for certain key components of this machine tool. Um, to then pre, uh, calculate how much value uh, was used up during the last months, and then calculating the fee from that. Yeah. I think that was really one of the of the main points that we brought into the project was the expertise on what parts are really mandatory in order to um, really execute this paper stress approach. So we identified, like uh, for example, the spindle is a component uh, which is very uh, critical to the machine itself because we could see uh, with some of our partner companies within the project that this is a very um, yeah, widespread reason for machine downtimes and it's also a cost uh, 
costly component. Like for example, there might be some smaller parts that you just would change in your general um, maintenance plan, but that's really the, the expertise that was uh, necessary in order to, to develop this, uh, this approach, yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Um, you also mentioned the question of a business model created by the sensor producer uh, that that he sees what his sensor is that's how I understood that his sensor is uh, a, 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 has the potential to detect special things and then but he did not have a business model but is it the, the question of the sensor or, or the component producer or is it not the competence of the uh, system which means machine producer to mm -hmm. develop a business models with the knowledge of what the sensor is capable of or whatever because yeah. he has the he, there's only one face there's only one face to the customer which is the system producer yeah yeah this is this is absolutely right so uh, it is usually the oem in this case it would be like a machine tool manufacturer uh, who is the face to the end user and in our pro in the project that I described, it was the component manufacturer that is producing the covers that contacted us to start this project to develop a smart cover. But obviously, and that's what we found out during the project, there was no real communication before upfront with the OEM that would use this cover, and also maybe with the end user of the machine. And that is what. Uh, uh, Mr. Hoffman tried to explain for such a business model, you have different network partner, and that is so difficult, that makes it so complex. And if you don't uh, clear, clarify this, uh, this collaboration in this uh, value creation network up front, then you might, I don't say that you do, but you might fail, even though the technical solution is working, as we could show in this project. And um, finally, the question. Do you have examples that this is a, a business model, a business model that is picked up or accepted by customers? I was sure this question yeah. would come, Wolsey. Yeah, can uh, you So, what, what kind of business models do you mean? So, just to understand the right question. So, these these business models in general, or uh, yeah, in general, like um, like the the, the question um, paper stress leasing. Mm -hmm. So for the paper stress leasing, you really have to say that it's a thing that is um, pretty much at the beginning right now. So it's not like uh, really put into the market on the industrial level, but we fetched uh, the interest of several uh, different machine tool producers, not only the ones that were part of the project. And I think it's also a really good point to address um, this whole resilience topic that is popping up right now. Uh, due to the um, increased flexibility, but um, as I just said, there's definitely some steps to go to put it uh, into the market right now. But in general, like database business models that build on these, um, yeah, on the on the analysis of data from the customers, they are getting more and more really into the market. Like for example, you can see with all the big machine tool producers, like for example. Um, Arborg or uh, DMG Mori, they are more and more enriching their physical products with database services that might that they might charge for, they might not charge for, but it's definitely not only like you you put a, a euro sign on the service that you have, but it can also be like for example to um, like bind the customer to your own ecosystem and maybe um, yeah, already uh, put his decision uh, what uh, kind of machine he's buying next uh, in front. So um, you definitely have to take all these aspects also into account. And uh, I think all these big players really demonstrate that database business models are already working when you are like doing it the right way and in a step by step configuration. Well, uh, maybe I can add. Yeah. We sometimes, as I said, expect the big bang. 
Yeah. You want the, the business model that is carrying a complete, complete company or a complete business today. And we don't have that. But we have many uh, uh, digital or database business models everywhere where a company or an OEM gets data from their machine users to tell about the status of the machine and give advice what to do next. There is already the start of a digital business model. And, uh, and we see this more and more evolving as uh, the data are uh, uh, achievable and uh, are easily available. Okay, thank you all together for this interesting presentation and discuss discussion afterwards. Uh, so to our um, users which are online, the next um, Let's talk science topic will touch the question of biological transformation within production presented by the Institute of Mechanical Engineering from the Technical University in Dresden. And for today I say hello and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. bye, -bye.